him cook. Then Joseph brought in Jacob his father and stood him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few, <coughs> few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained, have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers, in the days of their sojourning. Okay, now the word here for bless, Jacob blessed Pharaoh. I believe it's Baruch. Anyway, I've I've done a study on this, and it, it's the right analysis, regardless of the exact word. But it says in Hebrews that the lesser is blessed by the greater, and here Jacob is blessing Pharaoh. So it's making a point that Jacob is greater than Pharaoh. Okay, just so you know that. Now, that is not always the case. In other words, you can bless somebody and you can, uh, you know, in a different context. But I think the point that they're trying to make in this context is that Jacob walked forward and blessed Pharaoh. And as I said, we will have to go back to um, the, the account of Melchizedek. Well, we won't go there, but in the account of Melchizedek, it says that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And everybody in the Jewish society says, well, look at how great Abraham is. But if Melchizedek is blessing him, then Melchizedek is greater. I'll turn there just so you know. Um, you have, what's that? Bible, the note says, or greeted. Well, yes, or greeted. And that's why I say the same word can be put in different context. That's, that's what I'm getting at. But in this context, the reason why I think they put it in there so specifically is to make the point that Jacob is the greater of the two. See what I'm saying? I, it, it's the same word can be used differently. And so you have to be careful. Translators have to be careful when they're translating. But the very fact that they brought it in there and they didn't say that Pharaoh greeted him. Rather, it says Jacob blessed him or greeted him. But the fact that it says he did it rather than he did it is the Bible showing the greatness of Jacob. Yes? Hebrews 7.7. 7. Hebrew, that's hidden there right now. Hebrews 7.7 7 says, uh, thank you. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, he whose genealogy is not derived from them received the tithes from Abraham. Abraham gave Melchizedek the tithes and blessed him meaning Abraham who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. So there you go is that, that I think that's the point they're trying to make. And I don't want to be dogmatic about it because as I said, or as she said, some people will translate this, he greeted him. But the same word is used and so it's the translator's prerogative as to how they translate that. Greet, bless, hail, whatever. In this case they said in the New King James Version, blessed, because they're understanding the greatness of Jacob. He's, he's a greater man than Pharaoh despite Pharaoh's position as ruler over Egypt. So, and then um, the next verse of course it says he's 130 years. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were, okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm just I'm looking at the NIV which says the years of my pilgrimage. Right. And I like that richer word for it because sojourning is kind of hanging out. That's right. And this is the same as the New King James Version. It says my pilgrimage. And it does say that, repeats that in the New Testament, that we are pilgrims and strangers. I think it's a 2 Peter. Is that right? Anyway, uh, maybe 1 Peter. But we are pilgrims here. And so the word pilgrim, you're right. Sojourning just means you're kind of drifting around. And you know, I kind of went sojourning last year but uh, around the States. But a pilgrimage is somebody that has no home and he's looking for a, a better home, such as the pilgrims that came over from wherever, England? England in the early years. Anyway, and I had, a, but 130 years, he's, he's of age, and he says he obviously knew the genealogies of his father. And this was something that orally, until it was recorded by Moses, was handed down, would be how old people were. And, and so Jacob probably had memorized the entire genealogy from him all the way up to Adam. That's my guess, is that they would have retained this memory. And eventually, Moses received this and put it down in the law at Mount Sinai. But anyway, so you see what's going on there. Is I do believe that when it says he blessed him, it's making the point that Jacob is greater. Anyway, go ahead. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. Same thing, same word. Okay, and then it could mean departed from or said goodbye to, you know. The, like I say, that, that same word can be translated different ways. But in this context, I think he is making a point about Jacob. That because he is the seed of 
you know, uh, Seth, the godly line all the way down there, he is greater than the people around him. Okay, go ahead. And Joseph said of his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. Okay, now remember last week we were talking about how the land of Ramses, I think they also call it Goshen, but they said it's the best of the land, which it's the fertile area, it's where the Nile goes out and the land gets flat, and so it is good land, but it's also away from the Egyptians because they don't, they think that uh, Hebrews are abomination because they're shepherders and they, you know. So they're kind of working from both angles. The Egyptians are getting their good, and at the same time, the Israelites are getting their good. And we'll see at the account of Moses that this worked out anyway because there was a distinction made between the children of Israel and the people of Egypt who were dwelling along the Nile and more around the major cities when the plagues came. And since I brought up the plagues, were they supernatural or were they not supernatural? They were supernatural. Okay. Supernatural in what context then? Were they natural events that God directed or were they... Yes. That's what I believe. Now that doesn't mean it's right. I, I want to just discuss miracles just because it popped into my head and we might as well get this out of the way. Is that Miracles are normally God using nature to affect a purpose, okay? He can suspend nature, no problem, but usually he uses nature, such as the parting of the Red Sea. It's very specific. It says an east wind blew all that night. The east wind is what caused it to happen. The miracle isn't that an east wind blew and parted the waters. I said this one time in a sermon. That happens in Sarasota Bay, right outside of my house, Every year, five, six times, I could literally walk all the way across Sarasota Bay. The rest of the year, it's this deep. And then you get, but the only place I couldn't cross it is where they've done the dredging, you know, for the, the, the canal. But I've got, on both sides are the fill from where they have the canal, and so there's these sandbars. And if the north wind comes in, it pushes around, and all of the water goes out into the Gulf. And the bay literally almost dries up where I could go without ever getting above my knees all the way across the bay, and in some places, I could walk without ever getting wet. Okay, that's not a miracle. The miracle is that there were 650,550 uh, 650, men, okay, with women, with children, with all of their stuff. The Egyptians are here, the sea is here, and on both sides is a wall of rock, okay? And the fact is that God says, stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. It happened at the time when it wouldn't have otherwise, in other words, it needed to happen at that moment, and it happened, okay? The reason why I bring this up is I was watching something on the History Channel. I can't remember the guy. He's the naked archaeologist. Anybody ever seen that? Yeah. yeah, Jakob. Thank you. And he, he jumps to a lot of conclusions about archaeology. He, he makes just wild conclusions about things. But he does find evidence for things as well. So you have to kind of watch what he's doing. Well, he did a two-hour special one time on the, the, uh, the Ten Plagues. And he really jumped to some conclusions, conclusions there, but he stated them as fact. However, he went and he got information from past things, a, a certain volcano that blew up, we'll say, and I'm getting this wrong, but on the island of Crete, okay, at the time uh, that they believe was the uh, exodus. And then he showed how that would have affected something and how the, the blood in the Nile could have been done by something. We just had... Uh, Three days ago, a uh, lake in Texas turned blood red. Okay, it's on, you can read it on Drudge. It's blood red, and it's because of a natural thing that came out of the earth and did this. Well, anyway, he went through all of these things, and he came up with all of these parallels, saying that this explains this, this explains this, this explains this. And it, they were all very good explanations, and I had no problem with most of them, just because there's a volcano, and the ash comes over, and it's so thick that people can't see. If that's what happens, so be it. But the, the thing is that he never disputed this either, is that Moses said, tomorrow at noon or whatever, you know, whatever the Bible says, it will, darkness that you can feel, and then it happens. Or there will be, um, he explained how the frogs were a result of the, the geological disturbance that turned the water into blood, okay? And blood is iron, okay? The iron turns the water to red, whatever. And he's coming up with all these things. Then after the, the frogs comes the gnats because they're eating all of the bugs. And, and everything kind of fit into place. No problem there. If that's the way God did it, that's fine. The locusts come next, and it says that a wind came in or whatever, and he, he goes through and he describes it. I couldn't care. 
I could not care if it's natural or if it's not natural. What I care about is that Moses said, the Lord has said this will happen tomorrow at, at breakfast, and it happens. Or Moses said that, that there will be boils on all the people, and it happens. That is what matters to me, is that God is saying, if he uses nature to do something, no problem. The last one, though, I had to disagree with, is that um, with the plague of the firstborn's death. Okay, He's, he uh, said that the Egyptians, the firstborn, slept lower on a, 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 a certain type of a bed that was always lower than all the other Egyptians to signify that he was the firstborn. Okay, And he said because of that, this methane gas or whatever that was produced by a natural phenomenon would have killed all of the firstborns because they were lower in the room. Right? Well, suppose it was true. What is the problem with that? What else does the Bible say about the firstborn? It says that the firstborn of every animal, the firstborn of every flock. Well, they're not sleeping on lower beds. See what I'm saying? So even if that was true, that you could have a certain gas that hangs around at the lower level, it, it doesn't answer the question as why the firstborn of the flocks died. Because they weren't making special beds for their, their goats and their cows and all that. Anyway, so you got to be careful when you watch people like that because they are very convincing. And a lot of people will be led completely astray. To, oh, this must be true. But they haven't read the account. And as I said, he jumps over parts of the account. So it just came to my mind, and I, I wanted you to, to think about that. Whether it's nature or not is irrelevant. The fact that God directs nature for his purposes. Go ahead. The thing I find interesting about him, and I've watched the show quite a bit, is I don't agree with everything he says, everything. But the way he treats scripture is as actually did happen history. That's right. That's the one thing I like. You know, it's like, it's like, he doesn't say, you know, the legend says that blah, he goes, Abraham said that blah, 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 and da, da, da. You know, he reads it as yeah, this happened. This happened, and he quotes Moses. And when he diminishes the Bible, he's working against himself because the very thing that he is talking about and citing, and then he tries to refute it, refutes his own argument. So he needs to be consistent, and he's not. But I used to watch him until I got rid of uh, cable TV. But um, there is another guy that you'll see on some of these things. Finkelstein, I think it is, um, archaeologist. He's over in. Uh, uh, I, I, it might not be Finkelstein, he begins with an F, and boy does he hate being Jew. Boy does he hate all of the Jews, and he lives there, this is his home. And every possible thing that he can dismiss from the Bible, he will jump immediately to the con first conclusion made that dismisses the biblical account, and the guy is always proven wrong. Begins with an F, I want to say it's Finkelstein, but um, uh, anyway, he's, he's a guy that's over there, he's real famous. Anytime somebody finds something, they're walking along the street and they find something, he'll immediately dismiss it because he says, well, they're not true archaeologists. And how were the Dead Sea Scrolls found? By shepherds throwing a rock into a cave and they hear a clink and they say, well, let's go and see what that was. That's how these, yeah, that's how these things happen. A, a, a guy walking along the street in uh, um, Australia found something that was nice and shiny and very heavy. He took it in and it was like a four-pound thing of gold. That's how things normally happen. It doesn't happen by people going out. Yes, archaeologists do make discoveries, but the most of them are just people tripping over things. He immediately dismisses anything like that. If somebody finds something and validates something from the Bible, he hates, he hates the Bible. He hates that he's Jew. He's always working against his own people. I, I, I don't understand people like that. You got it, but they do the same thing here. The Jews in America hate that they're Jews. Look at the ones that serve with Obama. They're, they're just anti-Israel. I don't understand the, the concept. I don't mean to get off on that, but I just wanted to talk about the, uh, the, the miracles in the Bible because we're going to start getting into some more of them. Miracles in the Bible actually happened. How they happened is, can be speculated all day. Nobody ever argues that they actually happened. That's the thing that bothers me is when somebody comes out and this Finkelstein guy or whatever and he'll go and he'll try to disprove the Red Sea crossing. He won't try to disprove it. I'm sorry. What he will do is he will try to show that it was in real shallow water. He never tries to say this thing didn't happen because it's overwhelming evidence that it happened. 
Uh, and instead of it being 650,550 people or whatever the number is, he'll say, well, it was only 32,000. He just makes up a number all out of his head and he says, well, it was only a couple people and the water was only this deep and, you know, you hear these things. Yeah, the, the whole Egyptian army was totally incompetent because they drowned in, in waist-deep water.